Um, what does qualifying look like and what does your roster number look like? Uh, I'll start off with the roster number. Um, right now going into this year we're, uh, we're going to have 11 players on the team which is actually a little bit bigger than we uh, would like to have. Uh, my first year uh, at Oklahoma State three years ago we had nine freshmen and sophomores on the team so we had a big number from the previous coach so uh, COVID also put a played a role in that. Uh, we've got a couple that are using an extra 50 year, so it's a little bit bigger this year. Typically we'd like to have um, eight or nine. Uh, Tim's probably the max. Just to, enough to be competitive uh, within the team, but also small enough that uh, it doesn't spread us too thin as coaches in terms of working with the players. Um, for qualifying, uh, for us, we like to compete a lot. We promote a lot of competition on the team, and I think that's important. Um, with the development of our players, um, for them to, uh, to continue to, to compete against each other, uh, some of the best players in the world, um, that, that's an important part of their development and getting ready for the tournaments that they play. I'll say that the way we do it, um, the, we start off the year um, and, and basically they're, we're, we're just going off the numbers that they shoot in the first qualifier for the first tournament. After that, we have qualifiers um, really in between every tournament. Uh, we like to get 54 holes in a qualifying. We have at least one, sometimes two spots open every single week. So everybody on the team has a chance to, to, to play in the next tournament if they grab one of those spots. Um, so it gives everybody a chance to continue to work hard. And even if you haven't played all the way throughout the year and we're in the middle of March, if you get one of those spots, you're guaranteed to play in that tournament. Um, but as we go through the year, we, we take into account uh, what the qualifying scores are that week. Um, we, we take, as, especially as we get later into the year, we look a little bit more at what the tournament scores are. Uh, but that's how we determine the last few, few picks. I know on the men's side they do it a little bit differently, so I'm going to go ahead and Bill and Coach Donnie answer that same question. On you guys do qualifying really different. Uh, kind of, I'll talk about roster sizes because I think this is important for uh, you guys to understand that the, the COVID effect has been real for, for everybody. Um, in 2020, to start 2020, we were supposed to only have 10 guys and then we ended up having 15 because of the way uh, we had five guys want to use a fifth year. So I think that kind of put everybody in a tough spot. Um, so just be mindful of that when you look at these roster sizes across the country, they will get back to a more manageable number. Um, but COVID has played, it played a big role in that and, and we're starting to see it kind of dwindle a little bit. We're back to a number that we feel more comfortable with. but. Uh, I, yeah, from a qualifying standpoint, I think every institution does things differently. So when you go through that process, get a good idea of what they do. Um, there are some institutions that just will pick. You know what? We'll have observation rounds and I'm just going to pick. And then there's other guys that will have all five spots or six spots, depending on the tournament, um, available. So, and, and again, like Greg said, throughout the year, it, it depends on on, on um, the number of spots available. and, and uh, but. I agree that uh, you want to keep your team as competitive as possible throughout the year and, and create those nerves back home that you feel in tournaments. So even with you guys, when you're back home playing with your buddies, have something on the line, have something fun to, to be competing with because it's, it's uh, you want to try to replicate those tournament experiences back home. So if you're able to do that with your buddies, do that. Yeah, we, we follow right in line with what those guys are doing as well. The little bit of advice I would give you is the most important thing, in my opinion, when it comes to qualifying is communication and that you need to know what you're playing for before the qualifying begins. And whatever that is, it does not change no matter how it all shakes out. Um, I would encourage each one of you to ask questions when you do get to that recruiting stage, how they handle qualifying, like Bill said. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important to go along with that is if a coach tells you, I guarantee you're going to play when you come here and I'll guarantee you starts, I would be leery of that. Because everything in life is earned, right? And you're going to be a junior or senior eventually. Are you going to want him guaranteeing some junior golfer that they're guaranteed to be in the lineup when they come to play? So I think that's really important to recognize is that you want to communicate, you want to know what the rules are, and you never want the rules to change once the qualifying begins. And uh, a great program and good coaches, they're always going to communicate and they're always going to stick to their word. So with qualifying, we have Ryan Rody here who teaches these great 
players who are going to qualify. So what are the three top practice habits that you think golfers of this level need to incorporate so that they can play D1 golf or D2 or NAIA? Okay, so top three, I would say, one, I'd fall in line with these coaches and say that you should always be competing, have something that you're playing for. Um, probably one thing that I see probably everybody do is probably practicing too much uh, block practice and form. So just hitting shots on the range, you know, with an alignment rod and hitting full shots. So change that practice up when you're on the driving range, make sure that you're hitting shots that matter. Um, one thing I like to see people do is just kind of break up and take three, four, or five ball sets, and you're going, okay, out of this set, I'm gonna get four out of five, or I'm gonna get three out of four to know that I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat this club, I'm gonna pass through my seven iron. So make sure that, that you spend a, a small amount of your time doing your, your block practice, then get into what I would call random practice. So you're hitting different shots and changing clubs, going through a routine. Um, a lot of the range sessions I watch out of my better players, they get, they get kind of stuck on just pulling a ball and hitting full swings out there. So compete with your friends, do some random practice, um, those are my top two. Then I would just say make sure your practice is, is measurable. So after after you get done, do a good job of kind of making a journal where you can uh, you know you can reflect on those sessions and you can see the progress that you make over time, and then you can communicate that to your coach. So when I have sessions with junior golfers or college players, I'm asking them to tell me what's happened um, in a specific way, whether you know they're able to you know communicate to me, hey, in, in tournaments I'm seeing this, and in my practice I'm seeing a consistent miss and and be able to communicate that, those things to your coach, you're gonna get a lot more out of your practice with your coach, a lot more out with your uh, your high school and college coaches as well. One more for you. You have coached players that have played for all three of these programs. What do you see in those types of kids that they've gone to this, this high of a level? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say um, I'm always probably surprised with the work ethic that I see. So specific players have played it at Oklahoma, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State University, they always usually shock me with how hard they're working. Um, I've, I've had a, a couple people ask me specifically probably about, about Quade Cummins, and I mean, Quade would send me videos of him hitting balls at 9.45 at night, and that was not a one-time thing. So um, I just think that having that drive and kind of follow what Bo Van Pelt said earlier, like really know that where you're trying to go in the long term, and know that you're trying to get a little bit every better every day to get that milestone that you're looking for um, because there's a lot of a lot of kids in this room and there's a lot of golfers out in the world and and one way you gotta you just gotta work really really hard and if you can if you can put more time and work in and at the same time work really smart then I think you can be really good all right I hope you guys are thinking of questions because I'm going to open it up and have you all raise hands this is a really good question that I got from somebody besides good golf what is the number one thing that attracts you guys to a player? So I want each of you to answer that one. Besides good golf. Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously the good golf is what, for, for me anyway, that initially attracts us when we're in, in the recruiting process. But after that, uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, are really important in the recruiting process. Um, really getting to know the player, um, you know, initially our first phone call or video call with the player is, is really important to me. Um, in terms of how well we connect, um, how easy the conversation goes. Um, but also I'll tell you something that's important to me is when we have those calls, especially when we send some information to the players, is that they, they have good questions to ask. And we have some um, recruits that just, they've got a list of questions, really good questions, and, and, and I love answering those for them. Um, and I know that they've taken the time to read through the information. Um, they, they care about what they're doing. We've had other recruits that I, I ask them, do you have any questions? And they, after we've kind of our initial small talk, and they just say, no. Nope. And, uh, you know, and so I, I like the ones that, uh, that show some interest. Um, and so that's important. But, uh, but also when, when we bring them in uh, on visits, um, you know, how they interact with the team, um, how, how they interact with us as coaches, um, you know, all of that's very important because when you're going to be there in a place for four years, um, those are going to be, um, you know, the people that you're around for, for more, more often than not. Um, grades are obviously important. Um, want to know that you can handle, you know, missing, you know, throughout the year, 15, 16, 17, 18 class days uh, and still be able to stay on top of your academics. 
Um, that's an important piece to it. Um, and, then, and then also just getting to know the parents as well. Um, you know, because they're going to play a role in all of this, and, and it's important that uh, you know that, that we have a good connection with the parents as well, and, and and that we all have a good understanding of what our program is all about, and making sure that it's the right fit for the player. Um, that's that's really the big thing, because um, there's no perfect program out there, and it's really having a good fit between the coach and the player, and the player and the coach, and uh, and ultimately that's that's really what we're looking. That was a great answer. Um, I think for, for me personally, I'm going to be around you more than I am my family. I have three kids. I have a wife. And i gotta, I got to like you. I think that's first and foremost, um, you know, you got to enjoy being around me. And I got to enjoy being around you. And, um, I, I feel like most coaches are going to get a sense of that early on in the recruiting process. But uh, when we look at on-course stuff, I enjoy watching guys play bad. I do because I, I want to see if they – have what it takes to make a 76 into a 73. And because for us, that's that's a counting score most of the time. And that's a big deal. Are you able to dig in, find a way to get the most out of your round when you're playing pretty crappy? So, you know, scores are one thing, yes, yeah, scores are attractive, but does a guy have uh, the grit to stick out a tough round um, and take pride in that? Because you can have a, a bad first round in a three round tournament and then turn it on the last two days and have a chance to win a tournament. So, but if you're not willing to dig in your boots that first round and, and uh, have a what was me attitude, then unfortunately I don't think you're going to be a good fit for us. But I, I completely agree. It's a two-way street when it comes to a fit at, at the university. Um, make sure you understand what they do as a program and, and who they are. And then, and then same with us. We try to find out if you're in a, a good fit for our culture and who we are. Yeah, I think those guys both said great things, and what it boils down to is it really doesn't matter how good you play. If you're not a good person, if you're not taking care of your grades, if you're not doing the right things, then coaches aren't going to be very interested. And so this comment goes specifically to the boys in the room because I don't see this very often with the girls, but one of the first things I pay attention to when I'm watching a player is how you treat your mom. Because if you're going to be mean to your mom when she's trying to hand you a snack because you just made a bogey, then how are you going to treat me? I mean, your mom does everything for you, right? And I'm going to be the guy that's telling you things you don't want to hear sometimes. You're really going to be mean to me. So I think it's really important how you treat your family because coaches pay attention to that. Um, but I want to speak specifically like Bill did about what I look for in a player. Um, one, and it's the hardest two things I think to find, but for me, the key to guys that have I want to say got closest to maximizing their potential. Um, obviously, as Ryan said, you, those guys work extremely hard. Um, but for me, the two things are, it's how competitive are you and how much self-belief do you have? And a lot of times that self-belief will come from how hard you worked. So those three things are so tightly wound in what you find in great players. So I would just encourage each one of you Look in the mirror. How good do you want to be? And if you think you want to be great, ask yourself, are you working hard enough? And I'll give you the answer right now. The answer is no. Because I've never had a freshman come in that worked as hard as they needed to work if they wanted to get to where they truly wanted to be. You learn how to work hard. You learn how to be disciplined. You learn how to be patient. You learn how to be confident. And those things all come, and those are what make great players. One more for Coach Rohde. How much should these kids be taking lessons at this level, and how how much do you think is good in a collegiate level as well for lessons? Yeah, so that's I think that depends uh, kind of on the player. So I think you have to know who you are as a player. I think you have to understand um, understand your technique um, work. I would I would say when when you go and go to college, work with your college coaches and make sure that they understand, you know, who you're taking lessons from and communicate with them um, in an in advanced time. Hey, when, when can I go back and see my coach? If you're local, you know, what are the times can I do that? Make sure you're communicating with them. Again, they're, they're seeing you way more than I would see that player. So I think it's really important to, you know, even communicate with that, with that coach before you choose the school you're going to. How would, how would this look? What do you guys recommend on this? So then, 
you may you're probably going to have to make an adjustment with how much you see your coach that you're you know at home versus when you go off to a school that's further away. So you're going to have to make plans with your college coaches and with your coach in order to do that. I think that's extremely important. And um, and all these coaches do a really good job of of communicating with those players, but just make sure that you've got you're spending the time to communicate on both sides there. Again, when you go to college, you've got to grow up a little bit. It, it can't be a, a text message, you know, real quick to your coach and then go tell your coach, oh, I'm going to take a lesson. It, it works a little bit different when you when you grow up and take that next step. All right, and we got a great question they want to raise your hand for. I know someone's got it. Yes. Hey, Coach, I have a question. Um, along That's a great question. I, I think, and you'll no, see this. Okay, yes. Um, how important is the mental side of the game? Uh, I, I'm going to kind of, I love the mental side. I really think it's a, a, a huge asset. But when you, when you start looking at the most successful players on the PGA Tour, they have a team around them. That team generally consists of a swing coach, of a strength conditioning coach, of a, uh, an agent, and then the, a sports performance type coach. If they see the value in that, I think we should as, as junior players and college players. Um, they all talk about working with somebody or, or picking the brain of somebody else. Uh, I'm not sure what Oklahoma State has, but, um, but I, I think certain departments are, are moving in this direction. That's kind of the next forefront in, 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 uh, in I guess sports psychology is, is having one in-house for the universities to use and utilize. Um, we do at OU, and, and uh, certain players love to use it. Certain players just kind of you know keep a distance from it. But what I think you'll find across great players is they're going to try to find an edge to get better in every round. And so if there's a way that you can get better, stronger mentally throughout the round or, or in your preparation, because a lot of the things that they do and talk about is preparing yourself for a tournament and how can you best move through that tournament week. Um, and if, you're, if you think you struggle in that area, I think it's a great resource to, to explore and um, just find another way to do something different from somebody else to, to find an advantage. Ryan Rohde, uh, who's, been, who's been your best student and what has made them your best student? Good question. It's kind of a loaded question, I think. <laughs> um, that's, that's an interesting question to me. I, I probably have to think about it for a second. I, I'd probably say, I'd say it's a, it's a thing that can probably change um, because I think, I think players can go in waves where they're working really hard. I think other players can kind of, you know, we hit levels where we're doing things really well, and we might hit some times where we get off a little bit. I think uh, I'm probably going to say Quade Cummins right now. Don't tell him I said that because I want him to keep working hard. But I'd say uh, I'd probably say him for the reason I think he, I think he's really really competitive. I think he, I think he really works very very hard. I think he's always looking for these things like uh, Coach Alcorn was saying. He's always looking for ways to get better. He's open to things. Um, and I think when he's struggling too, he can kind of sit back and, and look and, and view it in a way, okay, this is a time for me to get better. It's not give me the quick one swing fix, which I think would be, you know, probably from Maggie's question earlier, how often are you taking lessons? Um, you know, some guys come in, they're going, hey, get me back to where I was. Tell me something real quick. Let's get this, get this right. He's, he's looking kind of long term and he's not afraid to, to make a change and maybe it doesn't go great in the beginning. Um, so I think for those reasons, probably play. Again, I don't want him to know that right now, though. So I, I pick him. I think he's got. I think he works a little bit harder than some of the others right now, and I think he's got the the right mindset where he he sees where he's going in the future and where he's uh, where his ultimate goal is. How long has he worked with you? And then that time, have you switched to anybody else, or is it just? Okay, so that was a good question, Coach Dar asked. How long has he worked with me? And. Um, has he worked with anybody else and just stay the course? So he's worked with me since he was a sophomore in college. Um, so that was 2016, um, 2017. 2000, yeah, 2017 is when he came to see me. 
Um, he hasn't seen anybody else since, so he's just stayed working with me the entire time. So he stayed the course, and um, yeah, I think you know I think that that's been probably helpful. I think sometimes communication. I would I kind of added this communication with your coach is super important with your swing coach, letting him know, hey, this is what's happening on the course. Take the time to sit down and have conversations before lessons. And you know, don't be afraid to take 10 or 15 minutes, go through rounds, go through specific shots. Um, I think that's really important. I see a lot of successful juniors that, you know, they get their one, they get their early warm up, and then they're, you know, ready to talk about some things like, hey, can we make sure we're going the right direction? This is my really big thing that I want to come, you know, see you for, versus just jumping on that tee and starting to hit balls and say, what do you see today? Um, take the time to say, hey, I, I played in this AJJ in Tulsa. This is what I did really well. This is where I feel like I can improve. Um, and those coaching sessions will be a lot more effective. So Quaid is from Weatherford, Oklahoma. A lot of you guys are from Oklahoma. He never played a junior tournament outside of the state of Oklahoma. I think that's important for you guys and your families to hear. He loved competing and found ways to compete with little money. Does that make sense? So you can get to where you want to get. He's on the Corn Ferry Tour now. Uh, by not traveling and doing all this extravagant stuff. If you find places to play, he wouldn't, he didn't care about rankings, he didn't care about anything like that, he cared about getting better. And that's what he did when he was with us too. Um, I've never had a player ask more questions. He went from a guy who was just afraid to miss out on um, going to a tournament to now he's afraid to miss out on the PGA Tour. So he's constantly had that FOMO, if you want to call it, and uh, um, that's what has driven him. But he sat in rooms just like this, like you guys, and uh, um, loved competing and, and wanted to find any way to get better. So I think that I've seen that. I imagine you see it from your better players too, Donnie, is that, that they, they just ask questions and, and, and will do anything to get better. Okay, that's a lot of great stuff, I feel like. Hard stuff, getting better, practice, qualifying. Let's get to some fun stuff. So what's the team culture like? Does your team hang out away from the golf course? I know girls are different from guys. There's more drama, right, with the girls? So I want to hear from all of y'all on that. Team culture, hanging out. I know there's a lot of that going on. So let's start with Coach Craig. Yeah, our, our team does hang out a lot with each other. I actually wish they kind of branch out a little bit more. But the <laughs> part, part of that, I think, again, is because of COVID and there weren't a yeah. whole lot of classes on campus, so they did a lot of online stuff. We actually made a rule starting this year, starting this semester, that everybody needs to take at least two classes in person so they can get on campus and actually <coughs> experience the campus life and, and meet different people. But um, for us, we, we, we like to do uh, – you know, activities throughout the year um, away from the golf course. Um, we've done everything from going to escape houses to, you know, trampoline plays to just dinners at, uh, at our houses. Um, you know, just, just to have some fun together away from what we do all the time together. And, and they're always competing on the golf course and they're, and they're competing against each other. We want to try to have some fun away from golf a little bit as a team. Um, and so, you know, we're restricted a little bit on time because we're on, you know, both the fall and the spring. So we're always qualifying, we're always playing in tournaments, but, but we do like to have, uh, have some time where we get together um, away from the golf course. Uh, they're a good group. Um, we want them to be competitive, uh, you know, when they're competing and qualifying, but at the same time, uh, they need to be supportive of each other. Um, that's how you, you have a good team. Um, and, and root for each other. But uh, so those are some of the things that we, we try to do to, to create some of that. I think we kind of picture our team more as a fraternity. We, uh, we have a, a house, um, a golf house, whatever you want to call it, locker room area, and we can't get those guys out of there. And uh, I think that's a, a very fun environment for them to be in. Sundays at the Co is what they call it, where they watch football all day in the fall and, and uh, uh, have fun doing that. But uh, yeah, I, I, brotherhood maybe is a, a word to describe it. Like everybody's picking on each other. It's, it's just a fun fun environment to be a part of. That, that's the funnest part for me as a coach is being involved with the players and seeing them interact and, and uh, developing my personal relationship. Patrick Welch, a great shooter. We got guys that can dunk. Yeah, we got guys that play a lot of ball and can dunk and, and do that type of stuff. And we got some guys that are terrible at it that get in fun of it, so it's fun too. Um, 
yeah, a lot of jokes get made about people's hair, <laughs> weight, whatever. It's 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 fun, but uh, we we love each other, and that's that's they know that. Yeah, I think culture is a word that we throw around a lot anymore, and um, I think it's really important. And I think your best teams are your closest teams. And I think that there's a lot of times where you're trying to create a culture or you're trying to create a togetherness. And to me, it doesn't quite feel as real as when it just happens on its own, sitting around watching football together or something like that. So uh, I think that you'll be able to tell that when you take visits and you look around um, and you watch how the team interacts with one another, you're going to be able to tell real quick what's the culture like. Do the guys like each other? And when you get right down to it, that's what culture is, right? It's a group of guys that are all wanting to accomplish and achieve the same goal, and they're all putting themselves second and putting the team first, and you can feel that when you're around it. And um, it makes for a great environment. And, and I will just say that, um, obviously, our, our two programs, and, and Greg's included on the women's side, have been very fortunate. We've been the, probably the two best teams in the country over the last five years. So. Um, to reach the bar that we're playing at is pretty high, but there's a place for every player in this room in college golf, and you can find the same culture and the same experience and the same type of coaching that we're talking about here at a level that fits your golf ability as well. So you don't have to just play at one of the top two teams in the country to experience the things we're talking about. It's real, it's out there across college golf in general. There's a lot of great coaches, there's a lot of great programs, and I promise you, if you'll be honest with yourself, you'll find the right fit for you as well. But that fit, that culture, that's what's gonna make your college experience a great experience for you. So, any other questions out there? So how do you support your kids academically whenever really busy workout and golf schedule how do you support academically during the busy, busy schedule? Yeah, well, we're pretty conscious about uh, having that balance between academics and, and the school. Um, you know, our, our team GPA right now is a 3.61. Um, and so one, some of the things that, uh, um, that, that we do um, is we, we tell them up front, listen, if you, if you have uh, a week where you've got multiple exams or multiple papers, and it's just gonna, gonna be a hectic week for you. Let us know, we'll give you an extra day off, an extra two days off to take care of that stuff. I'd rather have them spend all day working on that at, in their apartment than being at practice, not really getting much done because they've got that in the back of their mind. Um, I think really most uh, athletic departments are gonna have a lot of academic support. Um, we have uh, an athletic academic advisor that works with our players along with their advisor on campus. Um, and so you, you've got a lot of resources. We've got the, you know, unlimited free tutoring for as many classes and as many days as, as you want to do it. Um, you know, so that's, the, all of that stuff is important. Um, you know, but the, really one of the main things for any of you to be successful playing college golf is you've got to have good communication with your professors. Um, and, and it's going to be up to you to take advantage of those resources that the university has, the tutors, the, uh, you know, the, the advisors, um, you know, and, and, and to have good communication with the coaches to make that happen. Because in golf, you're going to miss probably as much or more class than any other sport on campus. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely uh, um, a, a grind with both. I mean, again, we, we're very conscious of that. We actually, as far as how we schedule tournaments, um, our, what we try to do is we try to schedule every other weekend. So we're not piling tournament on, upon tournament, you know, two, three, four weeks in a row where they're just getting bogged down with uh, missing a lot of class, you know, throughout that period. So we want to try to get them some time to, to be able to, to get caught up on their academics. So, so we take into account a lot of different things, whether it's the practice, whether it's the, the uh, tournament schedule, and then all the resources that they have on campus. So that, that helps out quite a bit. You're great. <laughs> Any other burning questions? Yes. Um, how many days a week do you uh, do fitness and exercise? How many days a week do you do fitness and exercise? It depends on what your what part of the season you're in. Um, I feel like 
for the most part. You're real busy. Golf is a year-round sport. We're not like any other sport where you have a, a defined off-season. I guess the most off-season we have is kind of November to January. And um, so during those months, we're, we're in there daily, um, whereas your tournament schedule is dictated, or I'm sorry, your workout schedule is dictated on your tournament schedule. So you may be in there two times a week. Um, your travelers may only be there once. Um, the guys back home may be in there three times. So it really does uh, make a difference on a week to week. But I think the, the, the better programs have a master plan for, for their athletes throughout the year. And um, there's different phases throughout the, the year of what you're trying to accomplish. Ultimately, here's the key about fitness, guys, is, is you want to stay healthy and play this game as long as you can, okay? Um, it's, it's there to support your golf game. And you don't want it to take over and be your primary concern. But it's there to support the health of your golf game. So um, if you can do that and still play a lot of golf and be active and, and, and do physical fitness type activities, then that's, that's great. Can I start with it? Yep. Okay. We have how many players this week? 78. 78. We're going to have two winners. So that's 76 losers this week, <laughs> right? You, you can't live week to week. You just can't do it. you got to have a big picture in mind, just like how Rody talked about earlier, your, your big picture of getting better with your golf game from, from day to day, not even just week to week. So you got to keep that perspective in mind. I love it when people get excited about winning because winning is hard. Winning is really hard on any level. Um, and you just kind of have to manage those expectations. Um, it's not like a basketball game where you one of two people are going to win. You know, one of, in our team sports, one of 15 is going to win at a tournament, 12. And, and individually, one of 85 might win. So, uh, managing those expectations, but understanding that it's the process, and you gotta love the process. You gotta love the process more than you gotta love winning. To me, that's that's the important part of this sport compared to other sports. Is you're not gonna win much, but you gotta fall in love and, and enjoy the process. I, I think one of the most important things you can do is don't talk about it. <laughs> like. I, re I can remember back when I was a kid and I'd get in the car, and I I'm old obviously, and my dad would start to go over my round. Everything I did good and everything I did bad, like I didn't, I, I just lived it. I already know <laughs> what I did well and didn't do well. So um, what I've tried to do as I've gotten deeper into my coaching career is, um, you know, if they, t if they played well, I like to shake their hand and look them in the eye and let them know they played well. And if they didn't play well, I like to pat them on the shoulder and tell them that we're going to get them tomorrow. And then I want to address what caused the good golf or bad golf later when we're not emotional about it. And I think it's really important you have to know your audience, right? Like how long does your child stay emotional? Because don't bring it up when they're still emotional. Um, and I think that's really important. Like just they need to know that you're there to support them, that you care about them, that you love them, that their identity has nothing to do with what they shoot on a golf course. Um, and so, but then as you do get to the point where you got to coach them, I think it's just really important to be honest with them and help them manage their expectations. You know, if they want to win and you know that last week they didn't really practice hardly at all, then, then you, you got to gently massage that to where they understand like, look, the, the, your expectation level doesn't meet the, the output level that you're putting into this. Um, and I think that really helps kids understand kind of where they're at. But uh, the biggest thing is just just be supported and then choose your spots. Question? This goes along with that a little bit. And, and earlier, it was a little bit of a loaded question when I asked Ryan how long Quaid had worked with him and, and if he had only worked with him or if he had saw other people. Um, I thought I knew the answer. I wasn't positive. But the reason I asked that is, 
I think it's super important that as a player, if you are trying to develop and become an elite player, that you recognize that consistency is a really important key to that. Just show up and do the work every day. And I think it's really important if you have a good instructor, trust your instructor and work hard on what your instructor's having you work on and just keep moving forward. I talk to our players all the time about let's not react to what we shot today. Let's just try to be better today, or excuse me, better than we are today 90 days from now. So let's just look forward 90 days. And that way, if we have a bad round of golf and we make three bogeys because we three putted, we don't panic and go call and try to get a putting lesson or change putters. We just recognize like, well, 90 days from now, I want to be a better putter. So what do I need to do to become a better putter 90 days from now? And so I would encourage each one of you that if you have a good instructor, make sure you just have a plan and make sure you're staying the course. Don't jump from instructor to instructor to instructor because that's how you get lost as a player. Um, and then to go along with that, I will tell you this, if you have an instructor and you've worked with that same instructor for two years, and for two years he tells you that, oh, you're falling backwards at impact and you're, you have too much weight on your right side and you're collapsing down or something like that. If he's been telling you the same story for two years, it's time to get a second opinion because he's not fixing your problem, right? And that doesn't mean that you're gonna change instructors, that just means it's okay to get a second opinion, right? If you feel that you've stalled out. So I'm not sitting here telling that you have to use the same instructor all the time, but if you have a good one, don't, don't go away from it. If it's working, just stay patient, work hard and get a little better. And I'll give you a little story about Quaid. So uh, I'm not gonna name our player, but we had a player that was about the same age as Quaid, that also used to work with Ryan. And for whatever reason, that player went away from Ryan and then said to me just like six months ago, he said, um, I'm like, who are you working with now? He's out of the program now. I'm back working with Ryan. Oh, how come? Well, I used to beat Quaid all the time. And we both worked with Ryan and then I quit working with Ryan and then Quaid kept working Ryan, and now Quaid's kicking my ass. <laughs> so I went back to him, like, <laughs> get dumber. You know, it's like, well, why did you ever leave? Yep. You know, so I think it's really important. If you have somebody that's good, stay the course. Don't, don't go for quick answers, quick results. Just work hard, and you'll get better if you're getting good information. Any more burning questions? Yes, sir. Good question. How do you structure practice? Yeah, that is a good question. I, I think, and, and that's one that uh, you'll definitely, as you go through the recruiting process, want to talk to the coaches about to find out how they do that. Uh, for us, uh, in our program, um, we'll do a little bit of structured work, um, you know, with maybe some wedge practice or some short game practice, but a majority of the practice that uh, that they do is, is going to be their practice. Now, what we have them do is we have them set up a practice plan and we work with them on that practice plan. And so once we're done with our, you know, some work that we want everybody to do, maybe the, again, that wedge practice, short game practice, they're going off and they're doing their own practice that they have set up for themselves. So we don't, we don't do a one size fits all practice where everybody's going to do this for this amount of time and this for this amount of time because everybody has different needs in their golf game. And, and we want to recognize that. So, um, so as long as they're sticking with their practice and what they're doing, and and, and we're seeing progress with that, um, we're, we're going to let them continue to you know continue to do their thing. Um, so, but uh, but as far as um, you know that goes, I mean, we're we're going to let them do most of, of their own practice and, and and have that tailored to their needs and what they need to improve on and get done. We just compete. We, we play a ton of golf, and um, we think that's kind of what makes us who we are. We, we want to see, we want to put guys in situations to feel those nerves, and, and whether it's you competing against somebody else in a 18-round qualifier or a 12-hole uh, um, match play type 
thing that we set up, whatever it is, it, it's, it's going to be competitive. And um, when you talk about working one on one or, or working on certain aspects of your game, to me, that's that's on the players to find time to do that and then find time to grab us to help them with that and work with their instructors. We can't be a swing instructor, a putting instructor, a uh, mental coach, a, uh, a, a physical fitness coach, but we can't check all these boxes. Um, we just don't have the time to do it individually for every player. So um, players that, that are at our college level will communicate. That's why I'm talking about having a good team around you. Have, have a swing guy where you know exactly what you're working on and, and we, we will help you get input here and there. But uh, uh, I think for us, competition is, is what we, we only get 20 hours a week with you and we want to utilize those 20 hours by competing. I'll, I'll just say the same thing. Um, you know, with those 20 hours, uh, typically our week is going to be we've got three hours of, of working out. Um, we're going to play on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 54 holes. That accounts for 12 hours. So there's 15 of our 20 hours right there. So that only leaves five hours for three days. Um, so again, I mean, most of that work is going to be done uh, with, with the players' time. Yeah, we're very similar as well. We. Um we eat a training table lunch at the golf course with our team every day, so that's kind of where we set our plan for the day. We'll sit down and, and eat with our guys. What are you going to work on? What are you going to work on? What are you going to work on? And then they go out and work on it on their own, and then we slide in and, and try to help and encourage and reinforce everything they're doing. Um, if we do a group team practice of any sort, we're the same as OU. It's ultra competitive. It's one-on-one, -on -one, and can you beat the guy next to you? All right, now you guys want to go out and practice in the 140 degree weather, so I'm going to wrap this up. Last year we had a great question. We had Coach Hibble, Coach McGraw, Coach Llewellyn at Auburn, and Coach Andy Young at Tulsa, and Michael Boyd helped me, and he asked this question. What, who's been the greatest player you've ever coached who's someone we would not know, and why? Not a famous player, same with Ryan, and why? And then what's the funniest, most weirdest thing that's ever happened in a lesson for Ryan and on the road for you guys? So for the best player that I've ever coached was a player named Maria Hernandez um, from Spain. She, she played, when I was at Purdue, she was at Purdue. Um, and her four years there, um, she was a three-time first team All-American, NCAA champion her last year, and NCAA player of the year. And so she's played a little bit on the LPGA Tour, spent probably most of her time on the Ladies European Tour. But um, just going back to a lot of the things we talked about, I. I Probably have never seen anybody work as hard as she did. And this is something that uh, I wanted to add to what we're looking for for somebody that, uh, you know, outside of just scores. She's somebody that just absolutely loved to play golf. I mean, you did not have to tell her to, to go out. You didn't have, I mean, you didn't have to push her at all. She just, she couldn't wait when she got up in the morning to get out to the golf course, stay out there as late as she could. And, and that was a big reason why she was uh, successful. Oh boy. Uh, On the road. Um, I, I might have to come back on that one. <laughs> so I think the, the most talented player I've been around was the player of the year this year, Chris Goddard, up for us. Um, you'll see his name on the PGA Tour for a long time to come. He, he, just, he hammers the ball, extremely good ball striker. He, he's only going to get better with his hands and, and uh, putting. Um, but I, I want to talk about another player that, that has impressed me more. And, and it may be kind of more like a, a guy sitting here. Um, Stephen Campbell Jr., I didn't think he had a chance to play for us last year. A chance to play for us, period. And um, he had such a bad freshman year. He redshirted, wasn't good enough to play for us. And the guys got a, a will and a knack to, to get better every day and to, to find a way to sneak his way into that fifth spot in our lineup. And, he played for us 10 times maybe this year and um, never had just a great finish, but he was always a guy that was counting for us. Um, he'd count two of the three rounds and, and help us win a tournament. Um, and he was in the anchor match that we unfortunately lost to Arizona State this year, but he played great and he wanted the lights on him. Um, when, every, when all the matches were done, everybody was there watching his match and it was one on TV and all that. And he, Played some great golf. He did get it done, 
Uh, we got beat on a birdie on the 19th hole, but he played fantastic. So you got to want the moment. I feel like Steve is not there yet talent-wise, but he wants the moment more than anybody I've been around. So I want to say that. Fun of him all the time. We make fun of Steve all the time. <laughs> and, and, and he is the biggest punching bag that we have. So most of the funny stories involve around making fun of Steve. And, uh, but he takes it great and handles it well. But uh, not, it, when you're around guys, gosh, I don't know how many days a year we are around, you know, 250 days a year, um, funny things are going to happen all the time, so. Come on, give us some dirt. <laughs> Last year, Ibble said Quaid went to every convenience store. Like, he loves okay, convenience Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Quaid's grandma ran a convenience store, and so he grew up with a, just a love of convenience stores. So we stopped <laughs> maybe twice a day at different convenience stores because he just loved seeing what they had. So I mean, <laughs> the other funny thing is, is uh, Steve is very shy around girls. And so we pulled up next to two to, uh, ladies driving a car, and I rolled down the window, his window, and was honking and made sure that he had a conversation with me. <laughs> so he did, he did a great job, and he thanked me later for doing that because it got him over the edge. But, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's just fun. When you're with a group of guys, funny things are going to happen. The best player I ever coached was a guy named Pablo Martin. Uh, he played for us, uh, he was part of our 2006 national championship team, and um, most freakishly talented guy I've ever been around, a Spaniard. Uh, he won on the European tour while he was in college. He was the first player ever to win on the European tour as an amateur. Um, and went on and won two more times on the European tour, but then had some family uh, struggles. His father passed away and it really kind of set him off course. And, and he's kind of struggled with his game ever since then, but man, was he good. Um, I, I don't have any really, on, I, mean, I, I have a lot of really Matthew good stories, story. but they are not for this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matthew Wolf was crazy, right? Give us one story about him. No, he wasn't, no. He I thought he liked crazy. to dance all the time. No. <laughs> but I'll give you a good Bo Jin story. Bo's a kid on our team now. Uh, he's from China. Moved to Singapore when he was seven, moved to the United States when he was uh, 14 or 15. Six three, Chinese. Um, let me make fun of poor Bo, but he stutters, but he doesn't stutter in Chinese, according to a couple other people, but in English he stutters. And it doesn't matter what word he says, it's he stutters with yee 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 yee. And then he might, you know, yee yee yee, Donnie, do you know what we're having for lunch? <laughs> So anyway, so he comes to me and he's nervous and he's stuttering. He was a freshman and he says, hey coach, is it okay if I miss practice time for a little bit today? I want to go to an Asian student uh, meeting. And it was a, a, a club on campus. I'm like, yeah. And I think he thought I was going to say, oh yeah, that's a great idea, Bo. I think you should do that. Okay, but uh, I'm going to miss class. I'm like, or I'm going to miss practice. I'm like, it's fine, Bo. And I said, Bo, Bo, one thing. If you go, you have to talk to a girl while you're there. And his eyes get like this big, and he's like, oh. And then we had another Asian boy on the team at the time. I'm like, okay, Bright, you have to make sure he does this. So Bright says he's a nervous wreck the whole time. They go to the meeting, and as they're getting ready to walk in, a girl opens the door for him, and Bo told me, he's like, okay, I decided that was the girl I was gonna talk to. And so the whole meeting goes on, and they're there for like an hour and a half, and he says at the end of the meeting, he can't find her. And he's panicking, and Bright says, all we can say is, I'm gonna get in trouble with Coach Star. He's gonna give me a workout if I don't find that girl and talk to her. So sure enough, he goes up, he finds her, talks to her. They've been dating ever since. <laughs> so that's two years now, yeah. Okay, Robbie, funny lesson story, best student ever. Besides Quaid, sorry. Okay, so I'll do the best student ever. I'll do two ways, one kind of to show everybody how fast things can turn around. So there was a player that played for the University of Oklahoma. His name was William Crop. He missed a uh, second stage of Q school in, it's gotta be 2015 in the fall. And so then he came to me probably a week after second stage happened. And then I would say, a, so then we went, we worked for a year together. He went back to Q school. He got all the way through. So he got through second, uh, got through third, had conditional status. And then in the summertime, he was playing on conditional status. He was not getting into every, every tournament. He got a sponsor's exemption in this specific tournament. He finished tied for first in a corn ferry event and had, a, had two different putts to win that event. 
which most likely would have sent them to the PGA Tour. So just knowing how, you know, when that time comes, whether you're, you know, a junior golfer right now and you're, you know, a sophomore, junior, just that, that good golf, a few months of good golf can change really, really fast on um, rankings of where you are with your status and everything. It can change quickly. So just playing, playing some good tournaments in a row and you never know when that opportunity comes. So that was a really cool moment to be a part of with Will. And then I'd say um, one other student I have, just because um, this, this student plays golf for Coach Robertson, but uh, she, her name is Emma Whitaker, and her, her work ethic that she comes each, each lesson to, her attitude and her, her will to get better. I have an app that I use for my students called Coach Now, and a lot of times when I give a lesson, I'll have students, I'll, I'll ask them to post their homework and to give me feedback on their tournament rounds, and and post and a lot of times my coach now is only filled with notifications from Emma Whitaker. She is, she, her work ethic is awesome, her, her attitude's incredible, um, and she's, you know, when you go back to your coaches, just um, tell, tell them thank you. You know, she does a really good job. She makes me feel really good about myself, which probably is one reason why I'm picking her right now. But she tells me thank you for the lesson, thanks for seeing me, and it, you know, that goes a long way. To say thank you to your coaches and and to your parents too, that are that are taking the time to to help you chase your dreams and do these things for you. It takes a uh, it t- takes a team to to help you get to where you are, and uh, and that's that's really cool. So then, funny lesson story. Yeah, I can play. Never get hit. Yeah, I have some funny ones. <laughs> My funny ones are normally making fun of parents how they're acting in the in the lessons, though. So I don't know how well received this is going to be. Um, so I, I would say mo- most of my funny lesson stories are. Are, are again around parents, but I had one parent in a lesson one time. I, I couldn't even watch the student hit because he was standing, standing directly behind. I kept I would walk next to him, behind him, to the other side of him, and and then every time this this student hit, he would he would like flinch. So it, it, as soon as impact would go, he'd go like this, he, like he was trying to help the ball. And so finally, I talked to him. Said you got You got to sit down. This is this is crazy. Um, so that I mean that's that's one of many parent funny stories, but that's that's the one I'll share. Maggie has some good ones too. You got any, any trip, road trip? You think of one? I'll, I'll just say I mean, we we like to have a lot of fun on our trips um, and and uh, at, at everybody's expense. And so, you know, when we're on the road, um, you know, now nowadays with everybody's got a camera, it's just I mean, if somebody falls asleep, their mouth open, and they're you know I mean you're you're going to get the pictures taken. But I, I mean we'll we'll do things. We I had an instance one time um, you know, this past year where. We were leaving the golf course. We had just won the tournament, and and we take two minivans, and and um, I was in the second one, and the and the security guard stopped me, and stopped the first van with with Coach Maddie and the, and the players, and then stopped me with with our group, and and uh, and he said, "Hey, congratulations, that's awesome." And I and I thought he was talking about the tournament, and then he keeps going, it, "It's you're you're gonna have so much fun." It's, it's you know, it kept going on and on. I'm thinking this is kind of strange. I moved, we drove on, and it, it turns out that they told him, "Hey." You know that, that guy back there. His wife just had a baby. Uh, you know, and, and so make sure you know. Congratulate, congratulate him on that. So we're always doing stuff like that just to keep things loose and, and have fun with each other. But that's that's a part of it. I mean, you a part of what you're going to do. Uh, you know, college golf is so much fun, and it should be. And and you know, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into the you know the school. There's a lot of work that goes into the the golf. But I mean, ultimately, you, you've got to have some fun when you're doing it. And if you do, that's that's going to help create a lot of success for you. So enjoy it. Enjoy that. There are going to be some of the best memories you'll ever have in your life. Um, you're going to have a lot of stories when you're done. Um, and uh, you know, so so have fun with it. Um, enjoy it, and, and best of luck to all of you. So when you're emailing coaches, please make sure you email the right name to the right address. About twice a year, I get Dear Coach Dar. It's my email address. So just, just make sure you do the right thing. I always laugh.